Coming up on One Detroit, catch up with Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson for the latest on the political battle brewing in Oakland County, plus the latest headlines. Also coming up, how important is a street name? We'll take you to 12th and Claremont on the city's west side. And the untold stories of a city from family photo albums. I'm Christy McDonald. One Detroit is coming up. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV the Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and by Business Leaders for Michigan has five priorities to make Michigan a top 10 state. Achieve a balanced budget, cut long-term debt, fix our roads, improve all levels of education, further economic growth, plan for a stronger Michigan. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. This is Detroit at its finest. Everything is produced, bottled, in-house. This is the old Stroh's ice cream factory, so this is like a walk-in museum. It's a very, very cool space, but you know, when you think about Detroit, you don't think of vineyards. We have one of the largest urban vineyards in the city right now. Um, it's located in the Morningside community, and um, I really take pride in this project because I'm a lifelong Detroiter. We want to eradicate blight land in the city. Mm -hmm. We got like 80,000 square foot of vacant land in the city. We want to use this space and make it an oasis green space. So we want to encourage people that that side lot next to you, go out and purchase that land. We will show you how to set up a trellising system and we will actually buy the grape from you. You can come into the um, tasting room and you can say, wow, I'm actually drinking Detroit wine. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. From Detroit Vineyards, I'm Christy McDonald. We are so glad that you're with us. A lot coming up for you on the show. We're going to take on some of the biggest stories around, including the politics of replacing Oakland County Executive Brooks Patterson and the party dynamics going on there. Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson will debate it out. I'll referee coming up. Plus, rededicating 12th Street, balancing the corner's past with a hopeful future. And collections of old photos that tell new stories about Detroit. That's all coming up for you on the show. And we are starting off with some of the biggest stories that people are talking about. So say hello to our One Detroit contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News, Stephen Henderson of WDET. <laughs> Happy August, guys. It's always good to see you. Yep. Good to be here. All right. You know, um, we haven't talked really since the passing of Brooks Patterson. Right. And so much has been said about his legacy and his career. And I kind of want to take one step forward and say, where are we in Oakland County? As we talk about this shift of power and the and really the dynamics of party and and the demographics of what we're looking at in oakland county nolan i don't think we know yet where we are in oakland county that'll play out over the next uh few days or mm -hmm. few weeks uh you know there's a lot of scheming if you will on the democratic side democrats thought they had an easy route into that seat but of course they're they got intra-party squabbling you got andy meisner tre treasurer and david woodward the former oakland county commission chairman both want the job. Woodward tried to do a sort of some shenanigans to, to grease the skids from him. He stepped down for the board, wanted the board to appoint him, but I'm not sure that's now in place as much as he thought it was. So, you know, anything could happen here. I'm, you know, you, you, you could end up, and I think the most likely scenario now is we're going to end up with a, a special election. What do you think? Yeah, well, it's not just Democrats up to shenanigans. I mean, you saw this uh, Republican member of the commission texting everybody. Oh, yeah. Delete, delete, your delete, emails, delete. Right? And, and there's never that's good. Criminal. And there's <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of conversation <laughs> out there that he has cut a deal with some other Republicans on the board. David Woodward. Or he may have thought I mean, he did, right? Thought he did. Um, and who knows what's good now, yeah. that, they, now I, that they've been caught all with their hands. 
yeah. uh, you know, dirty. One, they, one of the, yeah, one of the real questions out. for Democrats here is, is how much you want this kind of internecine fight uh, next year, right? Uh, mm. They have a lot of other turf to defend and, and try to gain in Oakland County. Those two congressional seats that they won uh, two years ago, both will, will be tough to hang on to. If you spend a lot of money or you have the interest groups spend a lot of money fighting for Woodward mm. or Meisner, that's money that can't go to Haley Stevens yeah. or to Alicia Slack. And, you know there's going to uh, be a primary fight. Uh, I, 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 I see no way that around it and at it, this point. And, but, you know, um, I don't think it's a guarantee win for, for Democrats. I think if yeah, it depends. you've got some uh, big-name Republicans out there looking at the job, Mike Bouchard, yeah. Ruth Johnson, uh, you know, I think either one of them could could end up in that seat. Depends. I, mean, I, mean, I think what's interesting so, too is how Oakland County has changed yeah, a bit has. and where and yes, yeah, demographic yeah. has right. changed and, and, and we saw that in the last, last yeah, election. Yeah, we did and, and we should have seen more of it. I mean, Oakland County got this weird carve out to redraw its own uh, commission districts in a way that's different than every other county in the state. If they hadn't done that, uh, Democrats would have an even bigger advantage, uh, likely on that on that board. I think eventually you will see that after redistricting uh, uh, the next time that that it is a much more democratic county than even is represented in in the office holders. All of the statewide or countywide offices in Oakland are now democratic, mm -hmm. except sheriff uh, and, uh, and kind of executive, executive, executive when Brooks had it. But I talked to Mike Bishop about this uh, the other day. Mike was wiped out in the 2018 mm -hmm. election, and you know, up until this these past two elections. The line, the Democratic line, sort of stopped at 10 Mile, and above that, it was mostly a Republican county. Still, he said this election it went 16, 16. Mile and beyond. Oh, and the question is, was that a one-time thing? Uh, you know, is it just demographics? I, I don't think so. You saw a lot of the suburban women who had been pretty faithful to the Republican Party for a lot of years Crossover. shifting against. Yeah. Now, is that just a Trump factor? Will they come back when there's no Trump? Uh, that's the question everybody's looking at. Mm -hmm. as, we, as we go forward, let me ask you about this. In, in terms of how this sets up Oakland County and a leadership change at this at this point, where does it leave what has been a very stable county in prosperous terms of, county, yeah, yeah, a very prosperous county? Um, what can people expect once we have that kind of change? Well, it depends, again, who's in that seat. Uh, Ruth Johnson went over and, and talked to all of Brooks's people and said, will you stay if I win, if I run? I think if Bouchard or Johnson w wins that Patterson team, much of it will stay together. And it was as much his team as it was him that led to the sort of government you had in Oakland County. I think you get Woodward or you get um, Meisner, you're going to get a different team in place. What's that mean for this sort of pro-business government you've had in Oakland County. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the pro-business part of it is is not in and of itself problematic, but Brooks ignored a lot of the problems that you have uh, in in the more urban communities that you have in, in Oakland County. The, the county's changing, and there are some needs that cities have, there are some needs that uh, that the people who live in those cities have that have gone completely un, uh, unaddressed. If Meisner or Woodward gets that job, I would look for them to try to continue the economic success, but try to spread it out a little more. Uh, some of the people who have moved to Oakland County are in need of things that Oakland County is not used to uh, not like used what? to providing. A lot of the social services that that you know you've got a lot of Detroiters moving north into Oakland County. Brooks was always complaining about that. Uh, that means those communities change and their needs change. Uh, and I think a Democratic representative is going to sort of focus a little more on those things. Uh, the city of Pontiac, the people in the city of Pontiac have kind of been uh, left in the lurch. He, Brooks did do some things that, yeah, uh, that made some sense. Um, a lot of activity it's still a really, It's still a really desperate community. Uh, I think a Democratic executive would try to pay more attention to those things than we have seen And so, before. so you're talking about maybe more of a, you know, regional shift, so maybe transportation could come back up in a conversation if you have a different kind of leadership Very different in Oakland County? Of, yeah. well, it might. I mean, you know, you still have Mark Hackle out there who is in the Brooks mold in terms of, of those issues. Uh, you know, the question is, can they keep the jobs machine going out there? Can they keep it a tax-friendly environment? Mm, I would bet not if either, though, either of those two uh, uh, win. But if this thing goes to a special election, you might see other names in the race. And 
you know, right now they, mm -hmm. they thought they had it, you know, locked up, but you open this thing up and you might get some interesting names in that race. All right. Well, what else has been on your mind? You guys have been looking, there's a lot going on, <laughs> a lot going on in the headlines. And you were talking about trade and we saw a little bit of hit to the well, market. Well, well yeah, I mean, well. you look at what's been happening in the market, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not just going to be the stock markets. Uh, you have the auto industry and a lot of other industries now very, there's been so much turmoil in trade and so much up and down. They're now very wary, holding back on investments. Uh, we could be, you know, entering a recession we don't need to enter because of bad trade policies. And, you know, the president is playing this game with the tariffs. Democrats are playing the, this game with the, the new trade agreement with Mexico and Canada, the U.S. MCA. This is a, 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 an agreement written to their specifications, written for labor, and yet they won't pass it because they don't want to hand him anything that might help him in this next election. And in the meantime, you got <clears throat> people who are going to be losing jobs. Well, I mean, people are already losing jobs because of the mm -hmm. tariffs and, and right. things that are, that are in place. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, this will end up being a huge issue nationally next year. This will be the, the deciding factor, I think, though, in Michigan. You uh, think? I, th I think Could so, be. because we are so susceptible to... Uh, uh, you know, uh, to the, the effects of trade policy. I mean, any little change, uh, you know, uh, plays out really dramatically here mm -hmm. in Michigan, and people are afraid, they should be, I think, uh, that not only could this cause a recession, but it could cause the kind of uh, manufacturing slowdown that always sends Michigan into the, the barrel before everybody else. A deeper, else. longer mm -hmm. recession. Right. And, you know, we're being used as a pawn here yeah. because there's no reason not to pass that U USMCA agreement other than what its impact on the election. Mm -hmm. You keep Michigan, you throw Michigan in economic misery, Donald Trump likely won't win it. Yeah. 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 Um, and one thing that you brought up, of course, everyone is still talking about gun control sure. and any various plans or legislation that would be in place at the national level. Right. And, and I, I think uh, Elizabeth Warren's plan, which is different from some other folks, which focuses on this exemption that the gun manufacturers, the gun industry has had for a long time from any accountability for the products they make uh, and get sold, I think that's a, a very rich uh, uh, area for reform, that, that the idea that you know nobody else gets to make products and say, well, whatever happens with those is not our problem. Think of the cigarette industry, for instance, for years uh, got away with that. Now that's really different. The gun industry has been really savvy about linking their quote unquote rights to the Second Amendment but they don't exist. They are commerce, they are uh, businesses just like anyone else, and they, their, their business has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. It's just a, a matter of Congress saying, hey, this is commerce, we can regulate it the way we see fit, and if we want to regulate it to the, to the end of uh, a, a better public health outcome, uh, we can do it. But, but I see that since, especially because a Democratic candidate for president has put this forward or is talking about that, that there's no way that Republicans are going to well, there's no way. give there's on any of that. No way any, there's no way they're going to give on that one regardless. It's a backdoor gun ban. Because if you say you're going to hold gun manufacturers responsible for everything that's done with that gun, nobody's going to build a gun. Nobody's going to make a gun. And you put them... But people in, make cigarettes. And it's not People what, make cars. It's, people make all kinds of things that are dangerous but, but that cars are get would, regulated. But cars are not subject to that sort of product liability sure law are. that you're talking about. If you use a car in the way it's supposed to be used and you have an a accident, you can't sue the manufacturer. The manufacturers of cars are only liable for the defects they build. That's in. not true. That so is if, true. So if... if uh, if a, a car manufacturer were to say uh, putting VIN numbers on cars so that they could be but traced not is something we, well, here. but it is what it is some of the things that and we're talking about. There are VIN numbers on guns, it, and they can be traced. But what you're talking about in, with Elizabeth Warren's is if you take that gun and use it in the way that, that it's intended to be, be used, or there's no product defect, you can still sue the manufacturers. You I can't do that with a car. I don't think that's of what she's saying. I think what she's saying is that if the manufacturer, or especially the distributor, is irresponsible in the way that that takes place so that it ends up in illegal hands, uh, that there should be some traceable liability. And, Proving that irresponsibility and, 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 is going and, to be but difficult. If you, and the truth if you is take that... you out a car and you mow people, 10 people down on the street, depends that on how auto you got maker that car. can't be sued. So, so the, the truth is that 
90% uh, of the guns that are used in criminal activity mm -hmm. can be traced to a legal sale of at some point, right? Almost and, all. I would say 100%. And you're, the break... Nobody's making homemade guns. So she's not talking about just holding the manufacturers uh, responsible. I mean, what happens is that there is a break in the chain of custody mm -hmm. for these guns and, and then the responsibility for that but chain if, of custody. If somebody is I think sell, you can look at there that. There are already laws that, that cover the, the, the sale of guns, the illegal sale of guns, uh, uh, the black market on guns. People go to jail for that all the time. That's already regulated through ATF. What she's talking about is expanding liability to gun for makers the, yeah. for things that are beyond, well beyond their control. Well, it'll be no other manufacturer. It'll be interesting to that. see if a conversation can move forward when Congress does come back. I'm talking about red flag laws or talking about mm -hmm. any kind of expansion of background checks. All right. Okay, guys, thanks to you both. Thank We're going to catch up <laughs> next week. You know, there's a new show on PBS called Family Pictures USA. It explores American cities and towns through the lens of the family photo album. Remember those when you printed out pictures? Yeah. <laughs> the producers, they find rich personal stories that expand our understanding of shared history, our diversity, and common values. And the episode about Detroit premiered this week. And our associate producer, Will Glover, sat down with the show's executive producer, Don Perry, and he talked about how his team researched and uncovered unique stories in our city. Detroit, throughout its history, has always been a leader in terms of what's coming next for the rest of the country. It's like a bellwether. Uh, and so we thought, if you really want to understand America, come to Detroit. How do you find the particular stories that you know we get to follow in the first episode? We started a process roughly six months before we began filming here in, in, in Detroit to research the history. And in the course of doing that, we had a lot of input from people uh, here at the Historical Museum, uh, as well as at Wayne State University. We read a lot of books. We looked at a lot of uh, newspapers and magazines. Uh, and part of what our research is looking for not the, the bold face name kind of people, uh, but looking for those little stories that we get overlooked. So whereas we have great newspapers here in Detroit, our research focused on the smaller newspapers. Right. We would go into the neighborhoods, we would get the little throwaway things by the cash register or just as you're coming out the door, and we'd see who's in that because those people are being highlighted by folks just like them within their own communities as people that they recognize as leaders or are doing something that's positive. And that's the other thing. We're not looking for sensationalism. We're looking for the positive. We're looking, what can we learn that's going to be aspirational or uplifting? And so part of our research, as we were going through all those little things, we'd see these little names. And we kind of reach out to them and see, would you be interested in telling your story? What's your family connection to Detroit? So <coughs> the ultimate show, Family Pictures USA Detroit, it's the future and it's OK, uh, looks at Detroit as a, you know, from a framing device, uh, going through historically its evolution from frontier town to what it is now, uh, but through the family stories that kind of augment Native American history. Uh, what's happening with newcomers and immigrants to the community, uh, the contributions of African Americans to building Detroit, Detroit's music history, but not in the way that it's typically told. We went to Universal <coughs> Sound Studios. Uh, we went to, well, we got at Aretha through Joe's Record Store. We looked at histories that people are sitting on that are really interesting stories about Detroit and what makes it special. We did a series of what we call community photo sharing events. Those community photo sharing events are kind of a come one, come all. Uh, we were in seven different locations around the city. We invited people to come to museums, libraries, uh, churches, and share with us 10 to 15 minutes uh, their images and stories that meant the most to them. That's all we said to them. Bring those images, those stories that mean the most to you. We then, kind of going through and listening to all of that material, I mean, and we probably had, on average, 150, 175 people uh, come to those events. We kind of noticed patterns, and we noticed things that then became the thematic elements for the show. Uh, and then we used those personal testimonies to flesh out and provide nuance for those major themes. I don't think people are aware of the fact of how much of a debt we have to Native American, Indigenous people. I think it comes out in, in the show 
that, wow, not only are a lot of our street names, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the early history dependent on Native American folks here, but they helped to build a lot of what we see. What, if anything, is unique about this set of photos and the history and things like that that you're getting from Detroit in particular? So one of my favorite stories, uh, everybody knows about uh, Henry Ford, but how much do we really know about Henry Ford, right. right? And we have people in Detroit who have family uh, experiences with a Henry Ford that most of us never knew about. And we show that in, in, the, in the show. Um, we didn't know that there were people uh, in Detroit who were the bank. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that, that's uh, a really good. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was a really good story. Right, uh, and, and her her daughters and granddaughter, you know, talking about oh, she was a loan shark. Right. Well, you know, banks were being banks just like they were back, you know, today, right back then. And, and, a, and a, a guy with an idea in an unproven market couldn't get a bank loan, so he had to go to alternative places. But where have you ever heard that story about Henry Ford financing, you know, Ford Motor that way? It's in the family photos and in the family stories. You can find out more about our Family Pictures USA on our website. And finally, what's in a street name? In Detroit, there are a few streets and corners that evoke instant recognition like 12th and Claremont does. It was that location where the uprising of 1967 began on the city's west side. In the following years, 12th Street was renamed Rosa Parks. But recently, a 12th Street sign was rededicated at that intersection to reflect a knowledge of the past, as well as making that corner a symbol of growth for the future. I put it like this, anything that you wanted, you didn't have to go downtown. It was right here on 12th Street. They had delicatessens, bike shops, the bank, the bakery, the Euclid cleaners, record shops, shoe stores, used barbecue, drug stores. Everything was right here. 12th Street was taken down and they put up the sign Rose the Park, which was fine. But when they took down 12th Street, it took away a part of our history. I mean, everyone know what happened in 1967. They didn't just change the city of Detroit. They changed the whole course of America. So this is very historical to us in this community and the city of Detroit. My mother and father is going to pull the sign. Come over here. Get up, get up, get up. Get up. Can he reach it? Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yeah. good to me yeah that's what it was when I moved over in the 40s it was climb out at 12 that's what it had on the sign climb out at 12 the day that everything started burning on 12 on that Saturday I don't know what day it was it's a July and that's when everything went down here it was nothing never to say from that day that day and I can remember coming out my back door it came right here stood there because all this was on fire it was clean up it was so intense you could even you had to stand back there because the fire everything was still burning. Oh, wait, we're gonna get a couple more of those. Yeah, take it. Yeah, where are we looking for? Right. We are right with this today. There's a lot of work still need to be done. The unveiling of a street name. Okay. Nice. But there are so many other things that we need to do in this city in order for our communities, our people, to start believing in the community and believing in streets like the 12th Street. Wouldn't it be beautiful if that house over across the street wasn't abandoned and looking abandoned? That 100-year-old house over there, which was, you could, it was so beat down and trees before you couldn't even see it. And we decided that, you know, in the next going on the next 50 years what can we do to restore this area we're partnering with Motown and the Wright Museum the Detroit Historical Museum so that there'll be a museum in there but also arts program for young folks there's going to be act a sound studio in there for young folks be able to record music and we'll have space for storytelling and have shared creations with other artists come over here and help us you know we'll bring businesses back because there's plenty of space over here where we can get entrepreneurs to come over, investors to be able to come over, build houses, build businesses, whatever it may be. I just want to see 12 come back, you know what I'm saying, the way it was. 
And that'll do it for One Detroit. Thanks so much for joining me. We also appreciate the hospitality here at Detroit Vineyards. It's a great spot. We'll be back next Thursday. And until then, find us at DetroitPBS.org. I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you then. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV the Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and by Business Leaders for Michigan has five priorities to make Michigan a top 10 state. Achieve a balanced budget, cut long-term debt, fix our roads, improve all levels of education, further economic growth, plan for a stronger Michigan. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.